The question, however, is when are we crossing the line? We have a pretty good sense of what capitalist economic philosophy is, beginning with Adam Smith in 1776 and moving forward. Far too often people assume that capitalism does not believe in government. That would be Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, the Fountainhead, among her many classics, in which she argued government is almost always intrusive and in the way, and that capitalism can only exist in a pure form if there is no government at all. Reading Adam Smith, it is clear that government is necessary. Someone has to write the rules of economic engagement, enforce contracts that are violated, and yes, provide support for the general population, for example, through national defense, or perhaps these foundational industries, and I think everyone can agree that if there is an immediate health crisis, government intervention on behalf of certain industries does indeed serve the whole without violating the basic principles of capitalism. But what is outside the bounds? At what point are we no longer functioning like a capitalist economy? What sorts of industries should never be supported by the government if that government is to preserve our capitalist integrity? Certainly any of those that are supported for purely political interest would be outside the bounds of acceptability. Maybe the supply chain crisis that we are currently experiencing, which is to a large extent a matter of convenience for American consumers. Let's then look at that supply chain situation. The goods that we buy are produced locally and internationally, although increasingly Americans are purchasing foreign goods, widgets and gidgets as the old economic books used to call products. They come to our shores from somewhere else. And of course, they don't originate there. There is a massive global supply chain of producers, assemblers, designers. The raw materials come from one location, they move to another one, probably in another country, for initial manufacturing, and they make their way through the system. We can find the point of origin, we can trace every single product all the way through the global system until it makes its way to its destination. And of course, this is a gross simplification of what the global supply chain really looks like because each of those mid-destination points is also where other parts of the product are going to arrive. The leading economic philosophy today is called just-in-time strategy. You want the pieces to arrive just in time for assembly so the increasingly finished product can move to its next point of production. Because of that, if there is a disruption anywhere in the system, it could be an armed conflict among nations, it could be a global pandemic, it could be an earthquake or hurricane, it could be a new government just changing policy, it has profound implications throughout the global supply chain. The so-called ripple effect creates massive disruptions in the arrival of goods. That is what we've experienced in the last two years. One reason there is a global supply chain is because we purchase more and more of our products from abroad. Maybe part of the product or the entire product is assembled, manufactured, packaged, and shipped from across boundaries. If we go back in time, just a few generations, overwhelmingly Americans purchased and consumed American supplied goods. Made in America meant something, and America was a country that was largely self-sufficient. But over time, as you can see from this graph, the portion of the things that we consume that are made abroad has increased. Also, the volume of what we have consumed, what we purchase, has increased. So today, a majority of the items that we find in local stores are manufactured abroad. That makes us highly vulnerable to any disruptions in the global supply chain. Trade deals are a very big reason for that, the globalization of liberal economic policies, and by liberal I mean capitalism and free trade. 
If we look at the rise of free trade agreements, bilateral, regional, and international, they align pretty closely with the foreign origin of supplies. The broader we place this global trading network, the more local economies can provide material, labor, sourcing, and production of the goods that we consume. Manufacturing here in the United States as a result has been in severe decline. And that is something that we see throughout the Western world. It is the maturation of societies and economies. We evolved from an agrarian subsistence economy to a self-sustaining industrial society to post-industrial and now largely a service society. That means almost all the things that we buy have foreign origins. Economics from a capitalist perspective is pretty straightforward. This is your classic supply-demand graph. If supply and demand meet at that point is called equilibrium, the price of the product will be reasonable. However, if the demand increases without an increase in supply, we're going to see an increase in the price of that product. There are fewer widgets and gadgets available compared to the demand for them. Generally speaking, according to capitalism and Adam Smith, there's an invisible hand that fixes this problem. Either the production will increase or new suppliers will join the market. And in so doing, that returns the point to equilibrium. No need for government intervention. The invisible hand is the rational self-interest of individuals and corporations responding to market demands and opportunities. It is the beauty and the majesty of capitalism. Everyone pursues their own self-interest, and in so doing, every good and every service needed by society will be provided. We do have crises of supply and demand. We saw that beginning in early 2020, when suddenly everyone in the world needed a mask because of COVID. A shock to the international system that pushed the demand to an extreme to the point that supply could never keep up. COVID and global pandemics have that sort of an impact on the supply demand charts. So here is our crisis in 2020. There's an enormous demand for masks and other protective gear. The supply simply cannot keep up. Market forces alone do not allow us to generate the production needed to meet the needs of the American society, not to mention the world, when it comes to protective gear such as masks. Government intervention was needed. The government had to direct existing industries to begin to produce gloves, masks, gowns for those who are on the front line, and all sorts of other high demand items on the market. Our supply chain crisis has many stress points. A large number of them are overseas. Simply put, overseas markets are having a difficult time keeping up with demand. Disruptions from the pandemic or other external events have caused disruptions in the supply chain. But even when products reach American shores, there are more supply chain stress points. Our ports of call are overwhelmed. From Jacksonville to Seattle, Los Angeles to Boston, we cannot find enough workers and there doesn't seem to be enough time in the day to process all of the arriving international goods. And so those ships begin to pile up offshore which of course costs money and it raises the price of the goods. But even once they get inside the port system, we have a crisis of delivery in the United States. We are woefully understaffed in key industries, including transportation, such as trucking. Capitalism has a very simple answer for that. The market will correct this problem when truck drivers are paid a higher salary and better benefits, perhaps provided better job conditions. 
but to date we've not been able to keep up with the decline in the number of truckers. So at all points in the system, from your local grocery store to the foreign point of origin, there are stress points in the global supply chain, and capitalism to date does not seem to be able to fix them all. Why do we have this crisis? Well, a part of it, and I wouldn't say an overwhelming part of it, but certainly a portion of the reason is our relationship with China. Under the Trump administration and continued into the Biden administration, we've been trying to disengage to some extent from China. We have placed tariffs on Chinese products, quotas on their imports out of a concern that China is not playing by the rules. It is cheating to get an advantage and also out of a concern that many things that China produces are of critical importance for the United States, for our military, our automobile industry, our energy infrastructure. We're simply giving China too much leverage over the well-being of the United States. Some disentanglement of this trade relationship needs to happen. The global consumption surge that's been underway since the Cold War ended. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the rise of a truly global trading network, and with China's entry into it, many high population countries have become wealthier. There's a very clear relationship between liberal economic policy, meaning capitalism, open markets and free trade, and economic prosperity. With prosperity comes consumption, whether it's houses, Rolex watches, or any point in between. That surge places a lot of pressure on the global supply chain. Since COVID has begun to end, there's been a buying spree, especially in the Western world, but really globally, that has overwhelmed the supply chain industry. And finally, here in the United States, what is called the Great Resignation. For a host of reasons, Americans are not going back to work. When this lecture was taped in early November 2021, we were at an all-time high for Americans out of the workplace, by their own volition. Maybe they learned something because of COVID, that the stress just isn't worth it, that the rat race isn't paying off. For whatever reason, they're beginning to value staying at home, and millions of Americans are choosing to do exactly that. And if we're short in staff, it's very difficult to get products to the shelf and into the consumer's hands. For these reasons, we have a supply chain crisis in 2021 that's likely to still be ongoing as you watch this lecture. We now turn to economic philosophy, the policies that we choose in making our domestic and foreign policy. The most essential economic debate is between mercantilism on one end and free trade on the other. This is not a light switch. You're not really one or the other. Most countries are somewhere in between the gradations. China is a mercantilist nation. It maximizes its exports with a lot of government assistance and it minimizes its imports with a lot of protection measures provided by Beijing. In so doing, China is able to accumulate a very large amount of money. It has a trade imbalance in its favor, exporting a great deal, importing very little. For every product that the U.S. sends to China, China sends four products to the United States. That means American dollars are piling up in China. It can use those dollars to subsidize its industries. It can also use them to build the global economic system that it's been working on for several years now. $1.54 trillion in the new Silk Road or Belt and Road Initiative. Japan since 1945 has acted like a mercantilist country. We have allowed Japan to do this. We've given it what we call infant market protections allowing it to regenerate itself after the devastation of World War II in the hopes that it would move from mercantilist towards a free trade approach. For the most part, Japan has not done that. 
For much of its first century in existence, the United States was also a mercantilist power. After World War II, we went all in on the free trade side, both for us and the international system. And as the leading state, the most impressive country after World War II, we were able to require nations to pursue free trade policies. That process began at Bretton Woods in 1944 when the United States met with its allies before the Second World War had even ended. And what we said to them was unlike the statement of any emerging hegemon in modern history. Normally when a country becomes the dominant power, it takes territory and privileges away from the other powers. The United States of Bretton Woods did the exact opposite. We said to our allies, you'll keep your territory, we'll open our markets to you so that you can build your economies with the expectation that someday you will open your markets to us. It was a stunning development and one of the most important events of the 20th century. So how exactly does this free trade philosophy work? Here we have a number of nation states. Some of them are trading freely with one another. In so doing, they form an informal alliance of free trade nations and they behave differently. Normally, countries that trade with each other do not go to war with each other. As nations on the outside begin to observe, see the accumulation of wealth among the free traders, the lack of war among them, it decides to join the group, to change its stripes, and to become a free trade nation. Conflicts that occur are largely between the free trade nations and the non-free trade or fully outside of the free trade alliance. Those countries as well can realize that if they trade freely, adopt capitalist economic philosophies, they'll be more peaceful at home and also more prosperous as well. So by this point, almost the entire world is inside this free trade agreement. Two nations, as you can see, are refusing to play along. Those are mercantilist nations. And of course, they're not using free trade policies. They're the outliers in the system. Japan and China are the classic examples. What we have decided to do is to embrace them and to allow them to join the free trade network, even though they're behaving like mercantilist nations. This is a very big risk because they are greatly advantaged by their mercantilist policies, yet they have access to our economic markets. So how did China get here? I explained Japan earlier, post-World War II, allow them to develop, we give them a lot of latitude. That's not the case with China. It begins with the death of Mao Zedong in 1976. Deng Xiaoping and other technocrats succeeded him and took a much more pragmatic view to economics. They created specialized economic zones along the coastline that functioned like free trade regions within a communist country. Cold War ended, global trade markets expanded, China was allowed into the World Trade Organization and given highly favorable terms of trade. Under the assumption that by joining the WTO, it would adopt free trade policies. It clearly has not. As we look at the global supply chain today, China is at the center of many of the paths of production and shipment. And that translates into a great deal of leverage for the People's Republic of China. That is why industrial policy is a great decision. It affects our national security and economic well-being. One example of China's dominance and its leverage is that of rare earth elements. So these are elements, a dozen, two, maybe three of them, that are found in very low concentrations in the ground, but they're absolutely essential for all things electronic. They're a very valued commodity. China today produces 85% of the world's rare earth metals. And that means if it were to decide to boycott or simply consume them all rather than shipping them abroad, 
our economic system would face a very severe shortage of many important supply items. So what explains this? Because 50 years ago, we were the dominant rare earth supplier to the world's markets. And over the course of these decades, it has absolutely collapsed. One reason is the environment. As noted earlier, low concentrations means you have to dig up a lot of dirt in order to find enough rare earth metals to be productive. We value our environment. Secondly, as seemingly as when we would decline in production, China would simply take our place, so the market provided the rare earth metals that we needed. And also a healthy dose of short-sightedness, not realizing how this momentum would build over time. China, on the other hand, has risen to the dominant level in rare earth metals. Governments have directed the population and industry to dig up and produce rare earth. The Chinese have purchased three third-party areas in other countries, and the Chinese have been playing the long game, seeking to develop leverage over the United States, over Japan, and over the Western world, by dominating rare earth metals, and as you can see, they have succeeded. Having considered these three items, we now turn to U.S. foreign policy options. There are three of them. Renewed engagement, decoupling of economies, or the adoption of a new industrial policy. What does renewed engagement mean? Well, we go back to the earlier graph. Global free trade network. Most countries are categorized as free traders with the two obvious outliers. This strategy says keep doing what we're doing. Continue to trade in order to draw in the outliners and hopefully they will change their color and one day open their markets to free and fair trade. Very few Americans have optimism that this will happen and almost no one has the patience to wait long enough to see if it will. So the traditional American policy since 1945, create the global trading system, open your markets to foreign trade, and wait out all of the outliers seems to have run its course. Even though China is a member of the World Trade Organization, it is not adopting the deep and free trade rules of the WTO and as a result, it's pretty easy to conclude that renewed engagement simply will not work. It's also clear that the Biden administration has reached that conclusion because most of the previous Trump policies on China continue throughout 2021. Okay, how about another option, decoupling? This is a bit involved. Stage one, we begin to shift supply chains to others, trying to avoid supply chains that run through China. Stage number two, significant export restrictions on technology. It's already illegal to ship many high-tech items abroad, such as powerful computers. This would strengthen those rules and expand them to other areas where the Chinese may be copying our technology, mass producing it without all the R&D investment, and then making a profit on it. Stage three, countervailing and anti-dump duties. This means targeting China for its anti-free trade actions relative to its own domestic production. They're dumping when they're selling products below fair market value in order to run businesses out of the market. Then they can dominate that market. And finally, there is stage four, restricting our foreign investments. These are corporate and private investments that are being sent to China and restricting the number of Chinese FDIs that are allowed here in the United States. You can see why this second strategy is called decoupling. We're trying to disengage from the Chinese economy. With each and every one of these steps, there will be a counter Chinese proposal. They will work to harm us for any problems we cause in their economic approach. Mr. Biden, Mr. Xi, you can see them there meeting, a summit level event. A lot of issues on the table. Highly unlikely that those two leaders will agree 
on either re-engagement or decoupling. Here you can see China's new Silk Road, Belt and Road Initiative, waterways, land routes across the international system and reaching deep into Europe. It appears that China is well on its way to creating its own supply chain. Our last policy option is an industrial policy. And this in and of itself doesn't tell us a lot because it really depends on how ambitious we're going to be. On the least ambitious side, well, we would target a few sectors, really important ones, and we would help those industries reconfigure, provide them with the incentives, the resources, the tax breaks, so they can upgrade their facilities and become more competitive with other countries. On the ambitious side is to fundamentally change the country's economic infrastructure. Either one of those will require a massive amount of government intervention, a very heavy hand in the economy, one that we have not seen in more than a century. Should we decide to be ambitious, we are going to move significantly down the path towards mercantilism. And while people can argue this is a short-term policy for a desperately needed fix, it is very difficult to move from left to right on this economic spectrum. It's much easier to move from right to left. So we should take this with a grain of salt, the temptation of pouring money into key industries so that they can be competitive globally, knowing that that is going to abandon basic economic philosophies relating to capitalism. Three difficult choices, and that is why this is a great decision in 2022. We've now completed all eight traditional Great Decisions topic. There is one bonus lecture that I'll ask you to stay tuned for. We'll look at the Biden foreign policy agenda. Until then, thank you for attending. Stay engaged and make great decisions. All right, so that's great background and uh, understanding of economic policy. Um, so let's go forward. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Great Decision. There we go. So um, there were some additional materials that were provided by um, Great Decisions that helped flesh out some of these um, opportunities because that was a very high level kind of generic discussion of economic principles. And, uh, and one of these um, sources, which I'm happy to share with you and leave in the library here, is an uh, article, Foreign Policy, Economic Power, and U.S. Industrial Policy by Jonathan Chanis. And Jonathan is a, um, a global um, expert in global equities and commodities. He also worked at uh, Citigroup for many, many years and now is involved in the New Tide Asset Management Company. But he's, um, he's taught at the college level at, at uh, Columbia University at the graduate and undergraduate level, and is one an expert in the field. And his his perspective on industrial policy is that there's an intersection of political and economic power. So we're not looking at just the economic outcomes. We're also thinking about what the political uh, goals are. And so when we're, he's talking about economic power, he means um, in terms of obtaining one's preferences through production, consumption, purchase, or sale of goods and services. So again, you know, the, the, the things that capitalism does really well, um, and, and especially un, unfettered does very well. Uh, on the political power side, um, we're looking at the um, building on a range of factors from geography, demography, uh, the size of the population, leadership, armed forces, and also social cohesion of the population. So all these other different factors to help us um, shape how the policy works and ideally um, determining our economics, being able to increase our growth and wealth. And then the economics redistributes power and wealth globally, but also within this country. And a lot of the industrial policies uh, that we'll look at today um, are, are, are geared not just at um, optimizing the output or the, um, the income economically, but juggling a variety of different um, criteria and, and objectives. Um, again, just sort of another timeline, look at this with a little bit more specifics, you know, from uh, 
the 1970s when the China free trade was opened after um, Mao died, and uh, and then continuing to go on through many different administrations, globalization has has significantly increased, especially um, really ramping up in the two, uh, 2010s after the global financial crisis, as China built more and more of the global supply chain and and leveraged state capitalism to really increase its fortunes um, and and bring its its population out of poverty. You know they moved. Uh, an agrarian population that was very poor into the cities, into manufacturing, um, and, and subsidized it heavily. Uh, GDP for China grew from about um, $1 trillion, $1 trillion US dollars value um, to $14 trillion over this period of time. So, you know, just quantum growth, uh, unlike what we've seen, you know, they had farther to come, but um, but they certainly have been very successful. And um, and I think what's, what's interesting is that that's sort of an example to uh, the Biden administration, you know, maybe, maybe it's really important to think about how the U.S. government can help foster the um, fuel growth with a much more heavy hand than we've had in the past. Um, so the globalization is an inflection point, you know, by championing more government in intervention in the free market economy, you know, we're, um, and again, thinking about free market capitalism as neoliberalism is the perspective in, in this article. Um, the Chinese is, have succeeded and thrive with government control. You know, what do we have to learn from them? How can we do what they've done well? Um, but economic, China's economic success has also created a major U.S. security threat. Um, we, we think that militarily, as they threaten to take over Taiwan, responsible for, I believe, 95% of production of semiconductors in the, in the world. Um, it's about 75% of our consumption of semiconductors. Um, military buildup, you know, they've invested a lot of money in becoming a bigger military power, so they have more control. Um, they, they have designed for being a superpower. They control, as they said, rare metals used for chips, batteries, um, and and that are tied to our green future. So we can be very, um, uh, very much advocate and want to usher in the new green economy, but it's not easy to do without these really essential materials and tools that we're going to need. And um, and then lastly, you know, they're really striving for a technological parity, which they increasingly have. So our our goal is now to to become more nationalized, um, to to do what we can to, to get a competitive advantage and leap ahead. So what does China have in store? Well, their uh, next policy is made in China 2025. And there's a lot of components of this that mirror um, a, a superpower, <laughs> which they're trying to be. Uh, they're interested in next generation information technology and taking the forefront there. High-end computerized machines and robotics, again, for efficient production, um, less need of use of labor. Aerospace development. Um, so again, something where we've been very, very strong and, and a leading uh, in, in the world, we're now seeing our capabilities start to diminish in reference to how strong uh, China is getting and, and focusing on growth. Maritime equipment and high-end high-tech ships. Um, again, our Navy had been you know, dominant and now we see China making forays into um, the Pacific Rim uh, and, and, and challenging some of our, our trading partners. Advanced trains and railway equipment. This is one of the areas that the Biden administration is focusing on for domestic growth, um, and they're looking to, to be a provider of those goods and services. Energy saving motor vehicles, again, everybody into EVs, electronic vehicles. Um, energy efficient industrial equipment, uh, again, with energy being in, in uh, sharp supply and people trying to move away from our traditional sources with fossil fuels, um, looking to economize wherever we can with equipment that works much more efficiently. Agricultural equipment, you know, again, to be able to feed itself and harness the, uh, uh, the capability of their, of their country. New materials and processes, everything from industri um, manufacturing processes to um, uh, working with, again, these rare metals and, and, uh, and development. And then lastly, biopharma and state-of-the-art medical devices, which again, have become a much more important factor, especially when we think of the pandemic and what we've just gone through um, and the R&D that was developed and harnessed by the United States and um, promise of uh, premise of sharing it uh, with China to manufacture, you know, when that's proprietary intellectual property, again, puts us in a more vulnerable position and makes it harder for the companies that um, spent all the money developing that R&D and, and the United States, which also funded that, um, giving away that competitive advantage. So uh, those are all 
key factors that we have to look at as we're we're thinking about how China continues to grow and and, and advance beyond us. Um, and make no mistake, their goal is to be a superpower by 2049. So then we think about the United States and our policy objectives. And one of the challenges is that the Biden administration is committed to juggling goals for the US industrial policy. In the Great Decisions video, we talked about um, establishing national security and economic well being as really core goals for industrial policy. Uh, more on the periphery were um, supply chain and political goals, and, uh, and, and some additional goals that we're bringing to the fore um, climate change being highly important to us. Sustainable sustainability and social justice. So these other factors are, um, are, are more, more aspects to juggle as we try to go forward as opposed to just focusing very narrowly on economic um, optimization. As Chinese has, China's advances power economically and militarily, the, the Biden administration has advanced key policies aimed at increasing our economic independence, advancing our climate objectives, and improving social equity. So when you see our new policies, there's components of them that are operating on multiple fronts. Um, and uh, Brian Deese, the director of National Economic Council said, you know, we've got to be clear eyed that China and others are playing by a different set of rules and we can't ignore this or wish it away. So we're, we're feeling that free market economy is not going to take us where we need to go. And we need to be, you know, as, as heavy handed or you know, certainly more heavy handed in, in a government's role at forging the future. So in terms of our policy objectives, you know, economically, we're always looking at absolute gains and economic value, and that can be um, jobs and GDP output that increases our wealth. Uh, we're looking at competitive advantage from a technology standpoint, um, our captive manufacturing assets, raw materials, talent, et cetera, um, and in increased relative political power. So that's the not zero sum game, it's us in relation to China. So different aspects, different levers that we're gonna to pull to stimulate the economic activities and promote structural change, that last um, uh, economic policy lever that we would be pulling, we'd be targeting um, bringing manufacturing back to the United States in, in very significant ways, uh, targeting infrastructure to be able to, um, to, to um, support that manufacturing to support um, the movement of goods and services so that we can um, accomplish those goals. Um, increasing services also though, um, education, labor, immigration and energy management so that we can um, maintain all those different goals at once and try to advance them. So what policy instruments do we have? Just to reiterate, we've got tariffs, import quotas, and other trade restrictions. We've got direct subsidies that are tax credits or exemptions for producers or consumers. Um, in some cases, we're giving tax, tax credits to corporations who are manufacturing things. Um, and sometimes they're just grants where we're investing directly um, economically uh, with no, um, just to build the industries and to build, um, to build expertise. Uh, domestic procurement requirements. Increasingly, we see that um, the money can't be um, going to Chinese sources or Chinese um, offshore production. Um, domet, domet, direct state investment or R&D spending, um, training, infrastructure partnerships with the private sector, and lastly, currency manipulation are all different, different aspects of policy that can uh, move forward. So there was a couple of uh, policies that are recent policies that I wanted to take a look at today. Um, the first was the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And the second one is the CHIPS Act, which is for, national, for the semiconductors. Um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So that was um, approximately, there was a range of 147 to 115, 715 billion investment in federal highway, public transit, highway safety, research and rail programs. And so a wide variety of things that are gonna help us grow stronger at home, but there's um, there's technology in the middle there that's important to us, a, an aspect of greater independence that's assumed to happen with um, increasing our, um, our electronic vehicle charger infrastructure, um, investments in public transit, so we're less reliant on individual cars. Um, Brazilian infrastructure in terms of um, supply chains and grids, et cetera. 
Uh, so variety and high speed internet access to keep us all connected um, where we're not physically all getting together. We're, we're exchanging more information um, to everybody. But you'll see also a strong component of social equity too. Um, high speed internet access exists today, but you know, but not in all places and not for all people the same way. Um, investments in public transit, a lot of focus on making sure that that happens in, um, in cities and areas that don't have the, um, uh, where there's not as many uh, ability for cars and, uh, and, and ownership of cars. Um, and then certainly in the last one, um, upgrade the power infrastructure, again, by looking at our, um, our green economy, looking at um, renewable energy, um, trying to create an infrastructure and, and power grids that can actually accommodate that and be able to scale uh, to support manufacturing economy and increasingly manufacturing economy. And then last, um, investment in environmental re remediation, um, where there's been um, uh, environmental issues and challenges trying to um, mitigate the floods and the um, the fires, the heat, et cetera, um, that, are, that are causing problems for our population. So all of this is the benefits of which are very domestic um, for the most part. And then just to look at some of the clean energy focus and, and the amount of dollars going to those different items, um, just the, to the Office of Clean Energy to be able to administrate projects, um, spending $21 billion, um, developing and, and advancing clean hydrogen, $8 billion, advanced clean energy manufacturing tax credit of $8 billion, um, the vehicle charging station, 7.5 billion, uh, low emission buses and ferries, 7.5 billion, transmission storage and distribution in infrastructure project projects that are um, throughout the country, 5 billion, carbon capture, 3.5 billion, battery manufacturing, material processing grants, $6 billion, and then advanced nuclear reactor projects, $2.4 billion. And it's interesting because, you know, in terms of the, the power energy focus and the importance of energy in developing a strong economy, um, a lot of it is, is built on um, very diffuse um, power sources. And so it's interesting that the least expenditure is for nuclear reactor projects, which are probably the ones that will help bridge the gap between solar and wind power, being able to um, um, accommodate the growth that we're looking for. Uh, the next one, the CHIPS Science, CHIPS and Science Act. And I don't know if you know what CHIPS stands for. CHIPS is creating helpful incentives to produce semiconductors. It's a hard one to remember, but everything's got to have a snappy uh, acronym. Um, and then we're, we're overall, it's $280 billion that's both bolstering the U.S. semiconductor capacity, catalyzing research and development, creating regional high-tech hubs, and a bigger, more inclusive STEM resource, STEM being science, technology, um, and uh, math workforce. So um, expanding chip manufacturing in the US, uh, 40, 40 billion dollars of that is investment in memory chip manufacturing. And there's a couple new um, chip factories that have been announced up in upstate New York and Arizona and more to come probably. Um, promoting US innovation and wireless supply chains. So 1.5 billion for promoting and employing those wireless technologies that use open and interoperable radio access networks again, to keep us all, all connected. And then um, this is an important piece, catalyzing regional economic growth and development. So um, $10 billion to, to fuel regional innovation and technology hubs, where we go out to communities, particularly underserved communities, and bring together state governments and local governments, higher education um, organizations, labor unions, and businesses to create regional partnerships that will develop technology, innovation, and manufacturing sectors. So there's a wide variety of aspects of this, but um, the thought is by you know, really investing in ourselves and growing, we're also going to be taking moving ourselves forward and, and taking back some of that competitive advantage in terms of technology. Um, just we have a long way to go like to, to get our, our semiconductor technology um, to be that competitive internationally. Um, at this point, we're only um, supplying about 12% uh, of our own needs for semiconductors. And the, uh, we had been at 37% a while ago before, again, this economic development went to China and was offshored. Um, now we see that um, the, the Americas overall are about a third of what the... Um, of what 
with Asia Pacific is. And Asia Pacific, again, includes Taiwan, which is very big manufacturer that is um, at this point not controlled by China. China, but um, but they are reaching out to try to control China. Um, also, Korea as well, um, South Korea. So it's um, it's a long a lot to do, and so the industry is looking at this as really monumental legislation. Um, the markets have soft have softened quickly because we were in a shortage for so long. Inventory buildup had occurred everywhere. We're building in Asia, and it's estimated that it'd be 34, 30 to 40% cheaper. So that's one of the big challenges as well. When we're making all this investment, the free market economy doesn't, um, doesn't accommodate for that cost differential easily. That's the, that's the argument behind such fast investment. Um, supply chains are firmly consolidated there. So we've got to build our own supply chains now to get those articles and, and uh, services products throughout our country to, to do the manufacturing. Um, and it's simply economically uncompetitive to build in the US or Europe. And that's according to the CEO, uh, Patrick Gelsinger of Intel. But he sees the CHIPS Act as leveling the, leveling the paying field. It's the most significant piece of legislation in industrial policy since World War II. So it's, it's great promise. If you've read the news lately, um, the CHIPS market is actually soft and, and some of the projections for growth actually are shrinking from the major manufacturers. So it'll be interesting to see how, again, we balance things that we don't control economically you know, in the world with um, these wanting to advance our, our objectives to become independent and be a, a leading force in technology with semiconductors. Um, so thinking about how successfully these policies will be is a measurement of a variety of objectives. Again, we're not making it as simple as um, you know, what's the most optimized economic output uh, and that makes it it makes it simpler for economists to say I can measure that and I can tell you if it's working or not working. Um, we also have these other components and that's why um, the Biden administration has its work cut out for them trying to juggle all this at once. Um, if we're going to be successful for from an economic perspective, we would be uh, more competitive. Um, more competition, more competitive uh, job. We'd be creating more jobs. We'd be technologically gaining back the advantage. Um, from a political standpoint, we'd have less dependence on especially uh, not just a competitor, but increasingly an adversary in China. And that would we would be able to bolster our global power that seems to be waning um, as, as the um, zero-sum game of, of political power. China has increased and ours has shrunk globally you know, in comparison. Um, in terms of uh, social, you know, in reducing inequity and increasing opportunities, those are all important to us. And there's ways to measure how economic growth happens in those, those areas or with those populations that we're looking to support. And then environmentally, you know, how are we able to cut emissions um, to slow global warming and to mitigate damage? And again, um, these are lofty goals, especially with slowing global warming, realizing that, you know, many of our um, our allies with doing this in the Paris Agreement um, are starting to waffle as they have to balance the fact that, that they've got to heat their homes and fuel their economies and are turning back to fossil fuels to help support that. So it'll be interesting. Um, the Peterson Institute for International Economics measures industrial policy based on economic value. So they're just looking at it through the economic lens. And they looked at 50 policies in um, industrial policies over the last 50 years uh, over the last 50 years to see um, how did they stack up you know did they do a good job and it's interesting to see how the different levels levers are pulled and and whether they were effective so from a straight standpoint of trade measures um, we have uh, uh, we're also looking at did the industry become more competitive were jobs saved or created and did industry technology advance. Um, what's interesting to me, you know, automotive assembly as it migrated um, and all the policies that were related to that performed very well on all those fronts. So wonderful things going on there. Um, semiconductors from an anti-dumping standpoint and the policies we put in place there um, kind of failed miserably. You know, what is there to learn from how we've approached that in the past? Um, but then when we were um, opening for the foreign market opening phase of semiconductors, actually outsourcing was really effective here at home as well. We were able uh, to become a bit more competitive, but, but increasingly we were able to create jobs and, um, and the industry advanced significantly. 
solar panel tax credits, another important one on the clean energy front. You know, we see that it's not really becoming more competitive, that it's still uh, manufactured more cheaply in China, but, you know, we have been creating jobs and, uh, and advancing the industry. Um, but trade protection has not worked very well, again, because they were able to produce those much cheaper than we can. Uh, and we have the goal of, of outfitting more solar energy. Um, some other other um, industries, and not to go through all of these, but the ones that seem also relevant, uh, renewable energy, you know, where we're not really a lot more competitive than other other nations, we really are um, increasingly creating jobs and um, and advancing technology. Um, a, a real standout was Operation Warp Speed. So on the medical um, innovation front, um, and this wasn't something that happened instantly, though it it felt like it happened instantly because we needed it, you know, when the pandemic hit, but there were um, decades of investment in um, the technology for RNA that had been sponsored by the United States and fostered by the United States so that by the time COVID showed up, we were able to quickly solve that. And then the policies to remove legislative restrictions um, and, to, um, and, and, to, and to financially incentivize companies to, um, to manufacture, gear up manufacturing quickly by promising to buy you know, certain vaccines was really powerful and successful and, and certainly decreased the time to market by um, tenfold, you know, it's normally 10 years at least to bring those, uh, those products to market and we had them in market within a year. Um, and then also uh, subsidies wise, um, it's the Synthetic Fuels Corporation and Solyndra, you know, did very, very poorly. And again, bad, you know, battery technology and, and, and social, and, um, synthetic fuels, like trying to get away from fossil fuels technology, it's not been successful at all. So what is what is there to learn there about how that was approached that we don't repeat that, um, get that same, same result? Uh, the, the big challenge going forward is that we're facing very, very strong headwinds. So we've got a couple of policies that are ident identified to help us, you know, maximize a bunch of social goals, but importantly, you know, start to, uh, uh, increase our stature and our strength against China. Um, we're facing, you know, incredible inflation at home and abroad, and that um, not only makes it um, expensive for people to buy things. So, you know, again, supply and demand, there's less money to purchase those things. If they're buying them on credit, it costs them more to spend that money. Um, and then another side of that, that I just was thinking about listening to the, the great decisions video again, that um, as, as the export balance has China holding a lot of our U.S. dollars, those strong dollars help fuel you know, their initiatives. So it, it's, a, it's a tough economic situation to be in right now. Um, and also the threat of, of recession kind of looming that is holding back companies from investing heavily. Um, political divisiveness is also tough. So, you know, we all know midterms are coming up tomorrow um, and seeing what happens, the, not everyone has the same priorities. So to the extent the Biden administration has stepped forward with strong investment in these areas, and these have been bipartisan bills, it'll be interesting to see if there continues to be the kind of um, commitment and focus to keep moving those forward over the next two years and, and four years and thereafter. Because certainly those are very long haul um, investments and, and um, initiatives to be able to pay pay off and to, to reap the benefits of. In the short term, also, there's a Chinese military threat to Taiwan, which is um, something that we're watching very, very closely. Um, building up semiconductor capabilities does not happen overnight, you know, and we saw what happened with our um, supply chain. So, you know, if we get into a toe-to-toe a, a -to -toe match with China over, um, over semiconductor policy in the short term, it's going to be a hard one for us to manage. And then lastly, managing energy production at scale to be able to accommodate, you know, again, these lofty goals of, of the kinds of manufacturing, the kinds of infrastructure and building that's required um, as we try to rely more and more on renewable energy. So um, what do the, some of the experts have to say about that? The Morris Cohen, professor of manufacturing logistics at the Wharton School, um, thinks that the keys are gonna be competitive competitiveness, resilience, and agility. Um, he says, what we learned in our research is that it's not a no-brainer. You know, there's not one easy path forward. It's back to these interesting complex trade-offs, these relative costs shifting and governments doing everything they can to shift the balance so that the final decision will come to where they want it to be. Cost is always gonna matter, but we've learned to take into consideration other factors and perhaps give them more weight than we've given them in the past. And that's certainly going on with these new, um, these new policies. 
Um, a few resources that I looked at when I was um, developing this presentation, you know, certainly this uh, this article from Jonathan Chanis, and that can be available to you. If you're interested in understanding globalization better, there's a great episode of Freakonomics Radio for podcast listeners. And um, this link I can give you is um, you can list to, listen to the episode and then also see a transcript of the episode. But it puts in perspective, again, different different ideas about what's important with globalization and different goals and how that shifts over time depending on perspectives of the organization. And then um, a little bit more information from the Peterson International Institute of Economics. Um, they've got specific episodes on national security semiconductors and the U.S. move to cut off China. Um, so you can hear more about their perspective on that. And then will U.S. tax credits remake electric vehicle supply chains? So Again, some idea about are we going to be able to, from economist perspective, to accomplish what we've set out to do. So that's what I prepared for you today. And now I'd like to open it up and see if you have additional questions or, or really probably because I don't feel like an expert in this, um, just comments, you know, thoughts that you have about uh, where we are with industrial policy, um, concerns, certainly ex, ex insights or expertise you may have. We had one comment online that was with the trend of political polarization. So someone online just commented, this is not a question. Current political polarization in the US could make these policies difficult to advance. While the Made in America movement would support them, limiting governance, government spending and regulations could be a hindrance. So uh, just a comment that came in right before the slide that had that on there. So <laughs> that, that online learner was uh, very astute. Thinking of the same things. I'm taken aback. You look at that, and what was it in 1970 that China, that was only 50 years ago, 30 odd years after yeah. this, the Second World War. For, and they were down then because they were being attacked by Japan, mm -hmm. and we had to help them then. And now, well, again, with the sole focus, you know, it's been a very, very, it's state capitalism. So um, so China has set the, the agenda and harnessed capitalism to help fuel that. It wasn't just, you know, communism deciding we're investing in this and we're doing it our way. You know, they really have welcomed foreign investment. They have helped, um, uh, they've embraced our desire to make manufacture things cheaper other places, you know, to raise the global economy. So it is this dance between, um, you know, being able to, uh, to have cheaper items, you know, and, and having the advance where we can have semiconductors and so many things. I read a statistic that there were 40% um, increase in semiconductors in automo automobiles in the last two years. So again, probably electronic vehicles as they've advanced, we're becoming more and more dependent and that we'll need um, the 40 billion connected devices worldwide right now. Um, by 2030, there'll be 350 billion connected devices, smartphones and you know, smart watches and, um, and, and washing machines and all those things that are driven by you know, this really important technology. Where were we with the chips? Well, that was, remember Silicon Valley was, you know, yeah. the development of all that, you know, and we, and we, we, we offshored it. It was cheaper. It was, they were playing games with one thing more than something that we will all depend on maybe soon. <laughs> Well, and I and I read an article that you know has 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 silicon or has uh, semiconductor chips become the new energy. You know, where ener whoever controlled more energy was kind of a dominant power. Um, it's actually shifted a lot to uh, semiconductor chips because so many things are require them. I have wondered about um, what I understand is the increasing size of the middle class in China and how that may make a difference in terms of the cost of production of goods there and also the labor supply for some of their things like even the uh, rare metal um, um, digging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know a lot about that. I've been, you know, what I've read is that, um, again, you, you read some of the conditions in Foxconn factories for Apple, um, Apple 
iPhones and things like that. And it's not, it's not great conditions. It's better than people used to live back on the farm, you know, back in the countryside. But, um, but as people have advanced, they continue to be, you know, working in, in those circumstances and it still costs so much more. They're, they're paid far less than certainly, you know, the United States, but it's still a middle-class existence where there's so much more they can afford um, comparatively to where they were before. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how that all evolves. Back in the 1950s, China was largely agrarian. Yes. We watched the development. We watched them buy our old industrial equipment, take it over, take it apart, and start manufacturing their own. Yes. Then we watched them walk around all the trade conventions, everything that was going on with cameras and questions and things, and stealing everything they could to the point where by the 1980s, some of their industrial equipment was much more advanced than ours mm -hmm. because of government control and government emphasis on being industrial. They had a much different way of developing. It was not economically driven. It was driven by their need to be an industrial power in the world. They worked very hard and spent billions of dollars to reform their entire structure from agrarian to advanced industrial. Mm -hmm. And they had to do it in a short term timeline, which meant that they were on a totally different basis than the rest of the world. They were doing things economically that punished a lot of their own population for a long time, but they had to reform and reshape their entire structure. And they did it successfully only through government manipulation and control of the entire picture. I think that's true. And, and that singularity of focus and that and that power to be able to do that is something that we don't have here. We don't enforce that. You know, we don't say the state does it this way, but and um, people do, and you're right. And this is culturally a different place. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, but but that shows you, again, what singular focus can accomplish and how quickly it's happened. And, you know, make no mistake, you know, their goal is to dictate what goes on um, and to challenge international corporations increasingly, as well as um, as well as their own um, entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Alibaba's Jack Ma is, you know, kind of spirited away. And, um, you know, they're not in the interests of, of making um, distribution of wealth more equitable, the state is taking over those things and making it be for the good of the people, not for the good of the capitalists that are fueling it. Yes. It seems to me that uh, all of this that's presented by Great Decisions has been focused, it seems to me that uh, what's been presented by the Great Decisions folks is focused on a few major industries. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's probably because that's what, you know, the, the Biden administration, and I think even the Trump administration were focused on. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I've watched it over the last few years, and I spent a lot of my career involved in supply chain, okay. managing supply chains, um, it became very obvious that China was not going to lose, mm -hmm. okay, period. They, they are very much in it for the long run. And at, a, at some point in there, I remember thinking, boy, you know, you can go to Walmart, and this is a, an extreme exaggeration, but you could go to Walmart and for $100, you could buy a semi truck worth of stuff compared to the way things used to be, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me to think about if the last time I looked, the average or the median wage in this country was some somewhere in the mid $30,000. So call it $35,000, $36,000. Uh, much of that is uh, livable, if you will, uh, because of China mm -hmm. and our trade with China. And I haven't heard anybody suggest a solution to a lifestyle change that would be pretty obviously detrimental to a huge number of people in this country mm -hmm. uh, if those inexpensive goods was China still is mostly China, but it's moved to, you know, even before China it was going to Mexico, but now there's Vietnam and India and, and all of the underdeveloped countries are, for the most part, with the exception of Africa, are in the game, right? Mm -hmm. So the impact on the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of people in this country 
seems like it's not been addressed to me. It's, and I don't know if you've heard anything, but it, that's just more of a comment and an observation for me. Well, I think I think that's a strong one because again, it's not like we haven't benefited. Like all of the uh, um, advancement in the in our electronics and 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 a variety of household goods and um, that people consume have been cheaper and more affordable um, as a result of all this. And 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 as the CEO of Intel said. Um, Asia has built up its capability to be 30 to 40 percent cheaper for doing these things. And as we feel increasingly that people have to have a living wage, we want good paying jobs. Well, you know, there, there are many fold what it costs, you know, in China, certainly to do these things. And so how do you balance that? Like how much more productive do we have to be? How much how much better does our technology have to be to be able to um, to, to equalize that? And right now, government dollars are equalizing that. Um, but government dollars are our tax dollars, right? You know, that's. <laughs> um, at the, Don Williams is in the process of giving two talks on, on the demise of the nuclear energy in this country, and then a following talk on some alternatives. We look at these slides and the huge demand for electricity, whether it's to recharge all of these millions of vehicles that are going to be produced and uh, the amount of uh, energy it's going to take to make more energy and how little money is actually being spent on it. Where is all of this energy going to come from? I think that's the big question. You know, it's again, it's one thing to say we're subsidizing, you know, with direct grants, um, but at some point, we need the energy to fuel all these activities. And we have not been doing the manufacturing, we've been doing services. So as we get that capability, you know, there's only so much, um, there's only so much renewable energy that we can have. And depending on where we locate those facilities, you know, wind or solar may not be that viable um, as a, a complement. And again, it would only be a complement to, um, to the other energy sources. It's, it's gonna demand a lot. Just a real quick comment here. Uh, in preparation for coming here today, I was shocked. I looked at the shirt that I've got on my back right now, and it said "Made in Egypt." Ooh. <laughs> uh, I don't happen to have an iPhone. I don't happen to have. I happen to have a, a Casio watch. Yes. Uh, what if uh, we just decided we didn't need some of these things? Uh, I'm a graduate. I got a postgraduate degree. I've worked in the chemical industry all my life. Uh, and I don't need lots of these things that everybody thinks they need. What if we just stop buying some of this stuff that that's produced over in Taiwan and, Ch and China? Well, I think that's a good question. And I think people will have to start thinking through, you know, what does that new balance look like? Um, because in some cases, especially on the environmental front, like back to basics, like let's not, you know, let's let's avoid all those technological things. But again, you know, they're being built into more and more things. Like if you bought a, a washer and dryer recently, you know, the, the technology in the wash and dryer is more than it had been before. Um, if, if you're certainly electronic vehicles is the future, you know, you're not going to be able to buy a a gas vehicle in California in, I don't know, is it 2025, 2030? Anyway, soon you won't even be able to buy a, um, uh, anything but an electronic vehicle. And does it mean less of us will have those vehicles then? You know, maybe we'll all just be doing, you know, public transportation if we have to go someplace or walking or living in smaller communities. So I think it's interesting. It's not, um, there's no requirement that we all go in that direction, but, um, but, it, but going in that direction has severe, um, implications for how we're going to live our lives. Uh, I was I was struck by I, I think the whole idea that China has this giant GDP and the fact that they built it through the mercantilist method of doing business and they therefore can direct and have directed their country in a direction that they want to go. And then I took a look at our uh, Infrastructure Act, uh, the bill that uh, passed with no votes from one political party. Um, and it just seems to me that we are prisoners of our political divisiveness. If we, if we all agreed, we could do some of these things that we want to do. But the fact is, it seems like 50% of us won't agree on anything. <laughs> I, I think that's not a small hurdle right now. And and again, I, it, it, 
things that are likely to shift and change. And I think the big difference too is economically, we're into we're, we're going into rough waters, not just us, you know, the UK and and China is is economy is faltering. They're not growing nearly as fast. So there's there's implications for this, you know, continued really um uh, hockey stick growth generally that um that are slowing. And when that happens, then what happens to all of this? You know, like money gets tighter, jobs gets, you know, jobs get fewer, big layoffs in the tech field, you know, whether it's Twitter or whether it's um, meta, you know, so I think people have assumed that, you know, we're going to live a certain way going up, 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 and we'll find that that things will get tighter and it will change our priorities as a, as a country. Yes. Well, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is that uh, in this whole thing, there was very little discussion specifically about the way we're spending money as a country. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we say it's tax dollars, it's really not tax dollars, it's no dollars, it's debt. Oh, and, well. and, uh, and so I think there's going to be a day of reckoning. Yes, when that happens. And, and that day of reckoning may happen a lot sooner than we than we would like. Um, because we just keep spending, not just billions, which used to be a big number, but trillions. Yeah. And you look at uh, how much money we spent on some of those acts, I thought it was interesting that uh, 280 billion on the chip and whatever it was called act um, and on the, the the three top ones evidently that were listed there were only 51 billion oh, out that, of 280 billion. So where'd the rest of it go? Well, see, I'm sure there's a list someplace. There, there are lists. They're big, long lists, and they've got all different um, earmarks because they're advancing a lot of different specific goals. Um, it's interesting on the infrastructure bill to see um, how much of it was going toward the um, and uh, the clean energy part of the uh, Department of Energy, like you just it's sort of a slush fund, a slush fund to be developed to develop different pro uh, projects. So yeah. I don't think we know, and I don't think it's gonna. The fact that it's earmarked is going to be, you know, refined and and uh, and people will battle for it. And it won't it won't get spent quickly either. So the fact that it's earmarked doesn't mean it's all going out the door yet. I think it'll be interesting to see how much of it actually can get spent when we don't have control over all the semiconductors to do the things we want to do either. So I, I don't think we'll know where it all went. Yeah. Um, if you look at all the COVID money that was earmarked and spent, and there's billions of dollars that's just missing. Right. Who but took it? And that's um, I'd like to know that. I'm with this gentleman over here. I've got a Casio watch as well. Uh, uh, $29.95. I, it's the fourth one I've had. They last about five years. Um, <laughs> and that works pretty well for me. We do have people living uh, at thirty-five and dollars and $36,000 a year. If that's a median income, that's pretty amazing. But, you know, when we look around the world, we're rich. Yes. At that, you know, if you can walk out with $100 worth of stuff from Walmart, you're rich. Yeah. We, we take for granted that we should have all that stuff. And again, I think it's going to come, come back to haunt us. Um, and I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I think you're right about that. Any other questions? Mary? Going back to their singular focus, their education is totally different than ours. Their education is totally different than ours. Mm -hmm. And I think they have a focus. Yes, absolutely. And I would say, you know, and at the at the college level, the influx of Chinese students into American universities to learn the engineering is huge. And then they, and they're here for very specific um, purposes and goals and they bring back their knowledge. And you know, that's 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 an export as well as educating their populace. Any other questions? Yeah, I don't happen to have an iPhone, but I do have a, a phone. Yes. Uh, and uh, and it costs a lot less, but it works pretty well for, yes, for my exactly. needs. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, one more here. I joined his opinion because I'm being discriminated against because I have a flip phone. Oh, good. Just this weekend, I lost power. But they are not giving warnings to any anything that's not a smartphone related. Yeah. During the epidemic, I could not I could not get my flip phone. He, Myers calls me all the time. I I get my prescriptions mailed out to the farm, the whole thing, and they would not give me a shot because I didn't have a smartphone. So I had to get my son, who used to work for Bill Gates, who's got smartphones like crazy. He's a business owner and the whole thing. So Myers text him, and then I 
<laughs> and I try to get a hold of him, and then I get my flu shot for that. Mm -hmm. Now, this this weekend, just a great example of I'm I'm against uh, smartphones because I think they've taken over the world. I, you just can't. I, I I have a sister in law. It gets up in the morning. She stayed at the farm with me when my wife died, and she she gets up in the morning. She says, "Siri, what time is it? Where are my shoes?" and <laughs> The whole day consists of a series of of that. Now, if I I asked her, what what do you do in an emergency just for the fun of it? Well, uh, I don't know. I I said, do you know any phone numbers? No. And so consequently, yeah. I bought the whole thing this this weekend. Okay, I live on a farm, and I live on Social Security, and uh, and all the benefits that people say are gifts. And I'm very tight. I'm very, very careful. I still have a farm. And if I didn't have Medicare, and if I didn't have priority health, I'd be homeless. And so consequently, I have a flip phone. And so when I, and they gave me a message on my, they text me, and I don't know what the hell to do with a text. But at least I used to get the warnings, at least on the text. Now, they did, that was without power. Started at five o'clock and I knew the lights were flickering all by myself again, you know. And so, <laughs> so I, I said, well, gee was I got, I think I got an email the other day that said they're going to cut off that service of calling people. And I said, oh gosh. And so I bet at three o'clock in the morning, I call them. And they said, uh, oh, well, we can't take your call because you're, you don't have a smartphone. And I said, no, but you, you can call me before. And she said, well, our, our system is down, our tech system is down, and we're going to get IT people in. 11 hours later, I hear nothing from them, and I still haven't heard from them. So the, the question is, is that I, I'm afraid that it's a long haul in this system, you know, and, it, and it's funny, but it's, it, your point is exactly try, true. And well, I, av I avoid, in fact, I'm boycotting every... <laughs> I'm to the extreme. I'm, I'm boy fighting Any, anybody but their, if you're local, you're okay with me. I, like <laughs> I don't. Things. I don't go to these. I don't go to these stores. I go to, and I and I pay higher prices. Sure, I do. But uh, well, that, that's the point. You and you raise a good point. Is I think you know increasingly everything is more connected and more dependent on technology and the sharing of information that's happening um, all along the way. And if you um, and 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 what does society do because Old technologies are getting left behind, and people who can't connect are getting left behind. I think that's a that's an important challenge. Real quick anecdote: This is from the Lockhorns a week ago. Uh, Leroy says to his to his wife, "I accidentally called Alexa Siri, and now none of my smart appliances will work." See? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your attention today. And uh, I hope I hope this is valuable. Lee, thank you so much for giving this talk today. Appreciate it.